I'm going to start up the recording. All right, so welcome to today's session, and I really appreciate your time. I know everybody is very busy, um, but we wanted to gather together to be able to um, share what campuses are doing and really talk about how we best support our faculty during this time of remote teaching. Um, and in particular, as we head into the summer semester and then into the fall semester, what kinds of things can we put in place that are going to best prepare them um, and their students for where we're headed. So this session focuses primarily on faculty supports. On June 15th, we will have a session that focuses on supports for students. So we have four campuses that are gonna be sharing with us today, and then we also have um, two resources that will be shared by some of my colleagues at the SUNY Center for Professional Development. So a couple uh, just housekeeping things. Everyone is muted initially to elim eliminate some background noise that may happen and I'll apologize in advance because my dog is probably gonna bark at the mailman while we're in our webinar this morning. <laughs> so you just never know, right, when we're working from home. Um, and also if you could, as a participant, just remain muted during the presentation for that. Um, and then if we have time at the end, we'll open it up for questions. I would encourage you to use the chat to ask questions of our panelists. After they present, they will join the chat and be able to respond to your questions then. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and we post our recordings on our YouTube channel after it is captioned. So it should be up there probably by the end of the day tomorrow. I'll put that link in the chat for you for the the YouTube videos, and you'll also get this uh, whole presentation. Our participants are gonna be sharing with you some links and resources, and so you don't have to try to fervently copy those down. We'll give you the whole presentation. So today we are uh, joined, as I mentioned, by four of our SUNY campus colleagues. We have uh, Judy Littlejohn from SUNY Genesee Community College, Lisa Melahusky and Don Eckenrode from SUNY Fredonia, Kate Bonham and Rich McElrath from New Pulse, Teresa Gilliard Cook from Oswego, and then Chris Price and Jamie Heron from our Center for Professional Development will be joining us as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, move to Judy and I'm going to make sure that I unmute Judy. <laughs> that would help. All right, let's see. Judy you should be able to chat now. Hi, everyone can hear me? Great, Should yes. I go camera on or off? I'm not sure. Um, that is your preference. <laughs> All right, well, uh, good to see everybody. This is an awesome turnout. So, um, well, Aaron, will I be able to advance the slides or do you do that? So I have made you a co-host, so I hope you can. If not, I'm happy to do it for you. So we'll give it a shot. All right, um, um, let's see. Okay, let's try this. I just have to give you the, there you go. You should have the remote now. Oh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, I went too far. Sorry about that. Amateur hour here. Um, <laughs> I will only click it once. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'm the instructional designer at Genesee Community College in Batavia, and um, we have a really small department. I'm the only instructional designer. Uh, we have one person who works with students, and um, that's it. Um, we have a dean, and then there's a, a secretary who can support us. So in early March, when all of this started happening, um, we quickly, we were actually on spring break when things first um, sort of uh, went sideways. So we quickly, set up some resources for the faculty and planned what we would do when the faculty came back. And so we had, the first thing we'd made was the keep on teaching document that you see in the upper left. And um, that was a collaborative document. Um, and so that kind of guided faculty who had never used Blackboard before into what they could do, what they should put up first and how they should start communicating with their students. So that was really helpful. We also um, put together the useful Blackboard documentation that uh, we still, and these things are all still on our, our help website. And, um, and in the bottom left, you can see the Zoom instructions for students area. That is part of a template we made. We called it the contingency template. 
which I kept calling the calamity template, but um, we put this together so that we could quickly put all these resources into every Blackboard shell. And that way um, everybody had at least the, the bare bones that they needed to start communicating with their students and getting some of their course materials online. So we started training them in the classroom one-on-one -on -one, and um, then we had to start taking desks out of the rooms as the rules changed and um, then we uh, moved on. Um, so we moved all our training to Zoom. We set up daily um, black or drop-in sessions in Zoom. We had some media people working to train faculty on Zoom and we also use Ensemble. So we had to work that in too. And we also were training on Blackboard as we went along and continued to just work on building up the help resources. And let's see if I can. So this is an example of, um, we still have this up now because we're still doing this. So every day, um, Monday through Friday, Harold Strasser, he's our Blackboard administrator. He and I both have our Zoom rooms open for anybody who comes in for any reason. Um, so we'll work with them on Zoom, Blackboard Ensemble, or just, you know, obviously course design and anything like that. Um, I see the question, are you allocating Zoom licenses? So yes, we have, we have a pot of the pro licenses and um, we're just trying to make sure that anyone who's teaching um, <clears throat> in Zoom has the pro license and we're kind of juggling those around a little bit because not everybody's really using their license. So we are uh, just sort of monitoring that. And we know for summer, everybody who has a course has the Zoom Pro and uh, we're just keeping an eye on the storage and all of that and um, trying to make sure everybody's got what they need. Then we keep, um, so yeah, they can always come in to help us in Zoom. And if they can't come in those times, of course, we're pretty flexible because we're not going anywhere. But, um, and then we have the Zoom help and you can see our media at genesee.edu people are willing to help with Zoom, which is, which is good for us because it takes some of that um, burden off. So then we moved into April. And uh, so continuing with these Zoom drop-ins, every morning at nine o'clock, um, Harold and I have a meeting on Blackboard. We're also joined by our Dean um, and um, Serena who works with the students. So that's really been super helpful, I think, for us to touch base and see, well, we, you know, we can share who, who we've been working with, who's struggling with what, what's coming down the road. And, um, and so I think that that's, you know, what day of the week it is, what month are we in and all of that. So those meetings have been really helpful. And so in April, we also created the remote learning template because the decision was made to put all of, of summer remote. And, um, so this template, it was built out a little bit more. We've got all the Zoom um, and then a lot of the um, help and uh, student supports and all the different resources that we have in our template, our regular template that we built based on the um, Oscar rubric. So those, all of that is in every single course, which I think is, is helpful. And we're working with the faculty. I'm sort of uh, the project manager for all the summer courses now that they're all remote. So um, I've just been emailing them back and forth, touching base, making sure they've got their Zoom, they've got their ensemble, they know what they're doing with their template and they understand the expectations. So um, that's fun. Those start on Tuesday. So there's a lot of work left to do this week on those. Tuesday meaning the day after Memorial Day. So this is what it looks like. Um, we use Blackboard as our portal. So when faculty go in, this is the, the kind of stuff they see. Um, this is what the students are seeing, this online asynchronous symbol in the schedule. So that would represent just one of our already planned fully online courses. Then everything else has this online, some scheduled times required so that the students understand that they, um, they may have originally signed up for a face-to-face -face course, but now everything has this online component, meaning all the courses uh, have the Blackboard shell in use. And um, the ones that we're going to be face to face now have the Zoom component. And this is the banner from our remote learning um, template. So that again, to reinforce this idea that it's remote learning and the students under, you know, hopefully understand what they're getting into and the faculty help our, you know, kind of understand the expectation a little bit more. Um, let's see if I can. 
So now in May, so we're continuing, we still have all these drop-ins, we still have the Blackboard meetings. Then I sent out a survey of the faculty, like a, 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 you know, a faculty training needs analysis. And we're trying to figure out what, um, what types of workshops are in the greatest demand or what is there the biggest need for. And so we, I've created this uh, responsive course design workshop, which is um, ready to launch. Our Blackboard upgrade is tonight. So um, we got to you know, have to get a look at Blackboard tomorrow and see how that shakes out and then try to start these workshops either by the end of the week or early next week. Um, so and then the faculty, one of the questions was, are you willing to participate in training over the summer? And overwhelmingly, they said yes. So we're planning on running this four part workshop at least once a month and then um, having so if the workshop's a couple hours in the morning and then in the afternoon they would we would have targeted trainings on the tools we're talking about in the workshop in the morning so um i think that'll be interesting and fun so we'll see how that goes um hopefully next week and that's what that looks like this responsive course design um so what we did i built it all it's all in blackboard but we made a corresponding support website that's this resource site so it's responsivecoursedesign.com which we just barely started working on so if you do go look at that um please be patient because we have a lot a lot of work to do yet on it but um so this responsive course design program is broken into uh sections on design activities inclusion and communication which we kind of identified as the big four um, areas that we can focus on. So that's our plan for the fall. They, the, all the faculty have been advised by the provost to just kind of ready, be ready to be um, agile, if you will, in the fall, because we are hoping to be face-to-face, -face, but will most likely be remote, I think. Um, that's my opinion. So, um, but through this training course, we can help get anybody uh, who has a face-to-face -face class up to speed to be on remote successfully. So I know I've said a lot of stuff really fast but i'm here all the time and if anybody has any questions or wants to talk anymore i'm at um, jmlittlejohn at genesee.edu thank you judy i appreciate that mm -hmm. um and i'll ask you if you would go over to the chat and um see if you can respond to some conversation that's happening there sure i'd be happy to thank you thank you all right so All right, next uh, we have two of our colleagues from SUNY Fredonia, Lisa Melahusky is here and Don Eckenrode, and I'm, I've got to make sure to um, uh, unmute you. <laughs> so Lisa, you should be able to um, chat. Hi there. And, hi Lisa, and Don, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? I can, great. Great. Now would you um, like control of the screen? Lisa, would you like to drive? Yeah, I can drive. That's fine. Thanks. <laughs> all right. Sounds good. We'll give Lisa the control. Perfect. You should be all set. Um, I would just have to say, um, this is Dawn uh, from SUNY Fredonia. I'm the director of our professional development center. And our experiences um, are very um, similar uh, to what was already presented. Um, so we'll give you an overview of our timeline, where, where we've come from, where we're at, and where we're going. Um, so Lisa, if you'd like to go to the next slide. Okay, so here um, is our timeline of events. Um, March 11th, um, the notice came from the governor that we would be um, going to remote learning. Um, and we hit the ground running. Uh, Lisa and our associate provost had already um, worked on a plan um, for moving to digital learning this spring. So fortunately, we already had that plan uh, ready to go. Uh, so that afternoon, uh, we got together, we formed our digital instruction services team. It's a, a team of five faculty, plus our instructional designers and myself um, to um, start our um, training programs and to get information out as quickly as possible uh, to our faculty. Uh, this was the week before uh, we went on spring break and so we had that spring break week um, to really try and get our faculty up and up and running the best we could. So the 12th and the 13th, that was a Thursday and a Friday, uh, we opened a lab up and did in-person 
drop-in training uh, for faculty. So, and a, it was packed all day long, um, both days, um, and just really trying to see what people's needs were, uh, working one-on-one. -on -one. We had our digital instruction support team there um, to help address um, as many needs as possible. During that time as well, um, we started to work with our web developer to launch a, a continuity of instruction webpage. Um, it's our Keep on Teaching and Learning uh, website, and I have the URL here if anybody would like to visit it later on um, to see the resources that we um, curated and put in place. Uh, so that website went live um, that week. And um, the following week, we had to move all of our training um, to virtual workshops. In the next two weeks, we offered 21 virtual workshops and we recorded um, all of those sessions and made them available through our site as well so people could get on-demand supports. Um, and then following that, we saw that the workshops were starting to taper off with attendance. And so we shifted more to individualized support. Lisa, would you like to add anything? Um, yeah, so the, the key to all of this was having our DIS team, which is made up of faculty who use the tool. Um, just to be really honest, we're a Moodle campus. So if you jump on our site and start clicking on a bunch of our things, you're gonna get a lot of Moodle support, not Blackboard support. Um, but that was the key to our success was having those faculty um, and just very publicly they were amazing and came to us um, before I could even ask anyone so um, for campuses who are still looking for help I, I really encourage you to go to some of your faculty and see what they're willing to share I think I skipped a slide on let me go back one how's that yep now we're in the right place here I'm um, just to the different people that we collaborated with to get everything up and running the D, um, the DIS or the digital instruction support team was crucial. Um, that faculty support was definitely crucial in those early stages and continue to be critical um, in providing the types of supports that we need um, for our faculty. Uh, they will be continuing um, to work with us through the summer. So we're fortunate um, to have their support. Uh, we have very small staff staffing in our offices. Um, so it's, critical that we have those faculty on board. Um, also having our web content manager, um, as we started to see the types of information that people were looking for, what they needed, um, our marketing communications team was really great about helping us figure out how to curate those resources in a way that um, would get people to the on-demand information that they needed. Um, without overwhelming them. That was something, um, as you know, like we've been constantly bombarded with information. So we were really careful to curate information that we thought um, was the most point of need that, um, that our faculty and students would need. Uh, yeah. we and, also, that we could, and that we could offer enough support for. We didn't wanna just put up everything um, if the campus didn't feel like we had someone who was an expert who could answer the questions when they came back with that. We also had great support um, from our provost and academic leadership um, for communicating out um, to faculty and students um, where the resources were housed, what was being provided. Um, so the communication piece, um, working with our academic leadership um, was also crucial. Um, our ITS services as well um, came in and provided a lot of training, support, um, resources um, that helped us uh, get things off the ground. And our academic support service areas also um, were big contributors um, to the information that we were curating. And the way that we ended up structuring our continuity website um, based on the types of questions we were getting, we have a section for faculty, a section for students, and a section for external community partners. Um, so those are the way, those are the buckets that we were putting the information into. Um, so if you visit our website, that's how um, the breakdown is. Uh, and we provided um, at least weekly updates um, from academic leadership and from our digital instruction support team to let people know what resources were going to be available and um, what we were currently offering and the direction we were heading. Don, do you want me to do the, the next steps? Sure. Okay. Um, so that was our process for getting everyone up and running while the semester was live. Um, we did have two days before our spring break to meet with people individually and our intention had been to continue 
training in person over the spring break, but the uh, campus had shut that down, so we moved to that digital format. Now that the spring semester has ended, grades are due on Wednesday, um, we're asking people to take a better look at their fall courses. So one of the things that we keep hearing is that um, the only thing we know for certain is that we could possibly have to teach everything online um, and do that remote instruction for fall. So when we are planning now with our faculty for the fall semester, we're using that as our baseline and making sure that they're prepared for that. Now, if it turns out that they can come to campus or that they have some sort of mix of online and in person, um, then, then they'll, have, they'll be able to back off on that. But we wanna make sure that the faculty are as prepared as possible for the idea of being fully remote instruction. Um, so we are pulling together right now, um, I just hung up on a meeting with the associate provost about this, uh, the next round of this website where we're going to be outlining things into different chunks. So um, our fall template for our courses look a little different than they have in the past. Uh, we already have preloaded them with some things that people should be filling out. And those were things that included um, a communication plan um, where the plan was empty and you got to fill in all of your information, but it walks the faculty through uh, what that plan should include. Um, we put in a placeholder for the syllabus and we entered in uh, an, an example of what we call module guide. So if you're going to post a week's worth of content, this guide should have everything in it that the students need to know about so they, they can use it as a checklist. Um, so we put an example one in there so faculty can start thinking about how they want to um, outline those and, and take a look at that. Uh, and we put in a couple other things all in hidden so the students can't see them just yet. And then as the faculty fill them out, they're able to turn those on and start giving the students a little bit of the information um, that they need for the semester. Now that we are moving past spring grades being due and into summer, um, we are looking at developing um, more of like a six section training where we start with the idea of backward design. And then we walk faculty through a series of things um, to help them prep and break down what they have for their fall courses and start to think about putting it in remote learning. So that website that we have will remain, but we're gonna update it um, to include more of this step-by-step -step process and our workshops will be formed around that process. So if you don't know what backward design is and reading our piece on that isn't enough to get you started, then we'll offer a series of workshops that you could come to um, and get that information that you need to start working on that piece. Um, and we'll do that for each of the six steps that uh, we have broken down for the training. Don, did you wanna say anything else about that? Um, yeah, I think, um really um, we're going to have to take a look at what we've um, put together um, to date. Um, now we're at the stage of just revamping, revising, and making our resources more robust um, to support faculty through the summer. Yeah, and a shout out to our librarians who volunteered to take on live student support for us uh, through their librarian portal, um, which was also huge for us to know that the students had a place to go and immediately get someone um, even if they didn't know the answer, because our librarians are so amazing, would figure it out and get them the answer. Um, and that was a huge relief and a huge support relief for us so that we could focus on um, getting the faculty up and running as quickly as we could. All right, and we'll check through the chat to see if there's any questions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Don and Lisa. I appreciate that. Um, you know, it's really a great example of how you have employed many different areas of the campus to really just make this happen. And I, I love the shout out to librarians. Our librarians are just wonderful, aren't they? I think that they really, they really make it sometimes. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'll advance the slides here and I just need to change our, um, our speakers. So um, Kate, you should now be unmuted. Can you hear me? I can. Great. And I also uh, want to check Rich. Yep, I'm here. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, great. And uh, who would like access to drive the slides? Yeah, I can do that. All right, Kate. Okay, so you should be all set. Okay. 
Um, so great, thanks for having us. Um, I'm Kate Bowen from the Office of Instructional Technology and I'm here with my colleague Rich McElrath and he'll be over in the chat. So if anyone has questions, feel free to pop in there. Um, so we're really glad to be here to discuss our new training, which we're calling Developing a Blended Learning Course. So this training grew out of our experiences this semester as we saw faculty really needing to transition quickly to remote learning. Um, since the fall semester is still pretty uncertain, what we wanted to do was to provide specific guidance moving forward so that our faculty could learn how to build high quality and accessible remote learning courses as we felt this would give them the most flexibility moving into the fall. So we're using the term blended for this new model just to help us differenti differentiate it from our online or hybrid models, which already have their own definitions. Um, so for us, blended means uh, a course that has both synchronous and asynchronous components, and where the synchronous components could be delivered remotely if necessary. Um, we felt this model would give faculty the chance to pivot from remote delivery uh, if seated classes did become a possibility. Um, and also we heard from our faculty this semester, um, especially those who had never been through our regular development uh, process, that they really felt that they still needed those synchronous components um, in their classes. So unlike our regular online or hybrid training, this training is really pared down and just focuses on the necessities. Um, also, we have activities built into each module in order to encourage faculty to start building as they go. Um, this was really important to us because also unlike our regular training, um, this training is totally voluntary and it's not compensated. So we really wanted to make it as helpful and as streamlined as possible and not do something that would add any extra burden on faculty who are already overwhelmed in a lot of cases. So we had a number of goals for this training, but one of the most important was to work with existing faculty skill sets. Um, we saw many of our faculty really struggle with the technology this semester. So our course orientation focuses heavily on computer fundamentals as well as skill building. Um, then throughout our content, we focus heavily on best practices for remote delivery and online course design. And we tie all of these principles directly back to the OSCAR rubric, um, just to show faculty where those best practices are coming from. Um, all of our content modules are arranged so that faculty are scaffolded through incremental lessons. And that's really what makes it possible for them to start building as they learn um, right from module one. We really strongly encourage faculty to keep their options open for content development. And we stress that that can inc uh, include curating content. So we do talk a lot about OERs, um, LinkedIn learning content, which we have on our campus, um, library content, et cetera just as ways to build high quality courses without the faculty member um, having to be responsible for developing every last piece of content themselves. And finally, we really wanted to keep accessibility central to every section. So we do refer back constantly to the EIT accessibility guidelines for digital content. And we mentioned throughout the guidance why we're asking them to do things in a certain way um, and how those uh, different uh, components um, can be made compliant as they develop. So here are some quick screenshots of our training. Um, we really try to keep the design very clean and organized and to provide a lot of cues about where to find information or content. So this shot is of our course orientation section. Um, and you can see that it highlights those skill building components that I mentioned earlier. We also have a section that deals specifically with work from home, um, just in case that's still a reality for at least some faculty going into the fall. And throughout this whole section, we really model the idea of curating content. Um, and a lot of the resources here come directly from LinkedIn Learning. So we're using those um, to build in um, that information without having to make our own uh, content right from the start. Um, next, we have the first four modules of our content section, and these all involve course planning. So these modules um, include some course mapping tools to help faculty begin to lay out their course and to start thinking about how the synchronous and asynchronous components will interconnect because we felt that was really crucial. 
Um, also, we spent a lot of time going over time on task. Since that, since that was one thing both faculty and students really expressed difficulty with this semester. Um, we then go into communication, which is so important to all courses, but often overlooked. And finally, um, into those tools for building or curating content that I've been mentioning. Um, I also want to mention that alongside this training, we're offering our faculty a pre-built course template that my colleague Rich put together and that follows um, all this planning guidance and has placeholder items, um, folders, et cetera, so that faculty know where they're supposed to put all their content. And of course, everything is built um, so that the template starts out in an accessible format. Um, so far, faculty who have used this template um, have found it really helpful, so we're hoping we're hoping a lot more will continue to use it. I might have got off track with the slides. Um, so these are actually the, the last four modules um, of the content section. And this is where we get into course building and specific Blackboard tools. So this is really the nuts and bolts section, and there are a lot of how-to elements. Although we do go into specific use cases and where different types of learning tools or assessments would be most appropriate. Um, for some of this content in this section, we do link right to Blackboard documentation, again, showing that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, although we do have some of our own homegrown tutorials and videos sprinkled throughout. Um, and then just to give you an idea of our module, um, our last slide here is our module one, but all of our modules follow the same basic format. So we start by introducing the topic briefly, then we have the lessons as separate subfolders, and we finish with a module wrap up to tie everything together. Um, we have rolled this training out to our faculty already. It went live, I believe, May 1st, um, but I think a lot of faculty have been too busy to really look into it yet. So we're gonna start with some onboarding sessions um, tomorrow and Thursday just to sort of um, go through all this information with faculty, let them know these goals, um, go over the content and give them maybe a, a sample timeline of how they can keep themselves on track over the summer. Um, we do still consider this somewhat fluid. So if we acquire any new products, tools, services that we think would be helpful, um, we'll definitely work to keep this training current um, just so we can always be giving our faculty the best information as they build their courses this summer. Um, maybe Rich could put our emails in the chat. So if anyone has any questions about this um, or would like to see more, feel free to reach out. Thanks so much to both of you. Appreciate this model. It's great too because faculty will have a place to come back to for reference, right? And be able to uh, go back and forth as they continue to build their course and work through course management too when they're actually delivering it. So. Oh, definitely. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, I am going to switch over to our next uh, presenter, Teresa. And let's see. Teresa, can you try talking? Yep, I'm unmuted. You are here, all right, perfect. Here's your slide. I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Teresa Gilliard-Cook. I'm the Senior Instructional Designer at SUNY Oswego. Um, I put this, gave this slide to Erin like, <laughs> like at 11, um, but I have a few other things I wanna add before I go into that. Um, so we actually started planning in late February for this transition. Um, many of you know my Assistant Dean, Greg Ketchum, and he started pinging our CTO, Sean Moriarty, to say, hey, we've got to start thinking about this because we were looking back at the old plan from, I think, 2008, 2009 for like H1N1. So um, the, first group, the first meeting of the COVID-19 Academic and Technology Continuity Planning Group was on March 6th. So we started a little bit early. Um, because we saw the writing on the wall, we knew there was a good chance we could be going remote after spring break. So um, within a 10 day period, we pulled together all different kinds of things from um, our CTS group, figuring out how we were going to help our faculty and our students with technology, 
as well as what workshops were going to be offered um, and, and, and so many other pieces of this. Um, by March 10th, there was a website up for faculty to, to help support them with this concept of remote teaching. So right before spring break, we knew we weren't coming back. So, and I know John Kane's on this call, but CELT was amazing in jumping in and, and offering so many workshops for faculty to kind of help them start wrapping their head around some of this, as well as the tools that were um, available. The IDs did some um, um, office hour sessions to help our faculty um, because we realized that with the, um, the, the workshops with, that were tool-based, um, we could support that in helping faculty figure out, okay, what tools you might wanna consider using during this. So one of the things we did too, is that we um, started partnering with our CTS help desk for Blackboard support. So what that means is the instructional designers are now in um, our instance of service now, and we are taking all of those kinds of support tickets through there along with um, Kathy Dutton, who is, um, knows more about Blackboard than anybody I know. Um, and she's been wonderful in this, all of this too. Um, we've been, you know, doing what we can to develop resources to help our faculty. Um, and initially we were calling them, you know, calling it for remote teaching. Now we're calling it flexible teaching um, because that's what in essence faculty need to do is be more flexible in how this is all gonna come about. We, you know, who knows if we're gonna go fully um, online, if we're gonna have some ways to um, have some students on campus, all students on campus, um, so really it's just helping faculty think through what are those options and how can I be flexible with my teaching modality as we move forward. Um, one of the things we saw a lot too was we had a lot more discussions with faculty on how to, and these were faculty that we'd never really worked with before. So it was a lot of our face-to-face -face faculty who do nothing with um, anything online. We have some faculty who up until recently didn't even use Blackboard and I think we still have a few that might not have even touched it. Um, one of the things um, I've done along with our summer sessions coordinator and Greg and um, CTS is to make sure I've reached out to our summer faculty who will be making these transitions, letting them know what supports are available as well as a template we stream down our fully online template to really think about it from a flexible teaching standpoint and what we did too is in our fully online template, we have a lot of information on what should be in these different sections. We pulled it out, but what we did do is provide links out to different places we have the information. Um, because again, being our um, template and even more so our synchronous, our uh, accessible syllabus um, is long because again, we're explaining different things and explaining all of the principles as far as when you think of it from an online perspective. My concern was that it was way too long and faculty would see this and say, forget it. So if I figured if we could streamline it, make it shorter, and then if they wanted more information, they could click out to it through, because we kept, uh, we have a version of it in Google that faculty can click out to those specific sections. I think that was a little bit easier for them. Um, the website we created was, is, is called the Online Learning Portal, and I've included the link there. Um, it currently provides resources to support faculty in this transition. Um, we're gonna be doing a major rent, uh, update on this site over the next couple of weeks. I'll be working with my colleagues in CTS to do this, um, because again, it talks more about the concept of remote teaching, and we're looking at it now as, a more, as, as flexible teaching. Um, the student online portal, I just mentioned that because we, it was, you know, again, it was a joint effort with primarily CTS and that I worked with them too, as we thought about some different things that could help students, but we also made sure our faculty knew about that so they could point their students there for the different things students may be looking for. The last thing is we launched our workshop today <laughs> um, for flexible teaching. And so when we revise our website, a lot of it's gonna be based on those aspects of flexible teaching because now that's how we have to look at it. We had an incredible um, amount of people sign up for this workshop. Um, 
we had um, 113 faculty and staff sign up for this workshop. So this should be interesting to see how this goes. But we've really wanted faculty to know this was more self-paced um, and that you know, they could take what they wanted from it. If they wanted to participate, they can participate. Um, we're, we will have synchronous sessions. We will have some activities for faculty to do. Some of them are reflective. Some of them are in discussion form. Some of them are um, potential um, worksheets on how you can think about your blend. Um, yes, we use some stuff from Blendkit and some other um, institutions throughout the country that have had have really some wonderful materials. So what Greg and I have done is we're pulling this all together. The first module is finished because this is this was based on um, Blendkit initially, but again, trying to rethink it, we're revising many of the modules that are in there. This is a six week workshop for faculty. Um, and we've already told faculty we will run it again in the second half of the summer starting on on or about July 6. So those are the th some of the things we've been doing. Um, and I know there's a lot more going on in other campuses as well as ours too, because we're really still struggling to figure out what we're going to do for fall. That's it, Erin. Thank you, Teresa. You are welcome. I appreciate the links to the sites also so folks can go and kind of poke around a little bit more. Um, if you would just check the chat. I think there were a couple things that popped up while you were okay. sharing. So thank you for that. You're welcome. All right. Okay, so next uh, we have Chris Price, who is uh, my colleague from the SUNY Center for Professional Development. And um, Chris was instrumental in getting some of these groups together to support remote teaching faculty. So I'll have Chris talk about that and I'll pull up the groups while you do that, Chris. Sure, thanks, Erin. Uh, so this shouldn't take very long. Um, what one of the things we wanted to be able to do at this time is to connect faculty to other faculty across campuses uh, in the disciplines. Uh, we know that very frequently faculty, you know, want examples of things they're trying to do from those who teach the courses that they teach. Uh, so initially what we did was create uh, sort of cluster groups in um, the disciplines. So we had, if Aaron, you scroll down a little bit more, you'll be able to see them. We had some in, um, uh, health professions, we had some in STEM, we had some in humanities, social sciences. Uh, so we set those up initially, that was probably at the end of March. Uh, and we promoted them, tried to get people in there, uh, signed up on, on Workplace to, to use those. And uh, then we got some requests for uh, discipline specific groups. Uh, so you'll see, especially in the STEM areas. So we've set those up as well. Um, and I'm just going to say right now, this is, this is somewhat of an experiment to see which of these kind of take off and flourish and which kind of um, do not. Uh, you know, initially we thought bigger groups would be better. Uh, and, and we heard from faculty that they really just wanted to talk to other biologists or chemists or whatever. So uh, we've right now just been sort of publicizing these and folks have been signing up for them. Uh, and then we'll, we'll take a look. You know, we do intend on utilizing these groups to start to share resources. I did mention in the chat that one of the things we're looking at the CPD is a way to help campuses uh, inform others on other campuses know what resources they have uh, available that can be utilized for others uh, out, not on their campus. And so uh, one of the things we've been trying to do is figure out how to use these groups to get those that message out. Um, for the actual tool that we, we like, we're looking to create to actually uh, help folks inform others, I think we're gonna use something like a wiki. Um, we had a conversation last week with folks from UB, uh, IDs at UB about that, and um, we'll be looking into something like that that will promote more with this kind of community, folks that are actually supporting faculty so that they know, all right, I have this workshop, this course, uh, how do I inform others about it? And so. Uh, like I said, these groups, again, intended mostly for faculty to faculty communication. So uh, I asked Aaron to share this page. If you could share this page out with your faculty, 
Uh, we'll get them signed up. They're multi-company groups. So if you're from Stony Brook, um, you'll just have to create an account because right now Stony Brook's not using single sign-on for workplace, but all other campuses are, and they can just sign up, get in there. And uh, if I see things in disciplines, I've been posting them. I know uh, Jamie has and Alex Pickett has and others. And if they see things rel related to a discipline, discipline specific resource they've been putting these in these groups but frankly there hasn't been a lot of communication yet and partially that's because there just aren't you know more than a couple dozen people in many of these groups some of them have 50 60 70 and I get requests every day for folks to join them so um, uh, I think that's all I want to say so I give Jamie some time but if you have any questions about this you can pop them in the chat or just reach out to me directly yeah, no problem. Thank you, Chris, for that overview. Um, there is a quick bit.ly so that you can get to those groups on our COVID support site and it's just RT for remote teaching RT workplace groups. Um, just a quick way for you to get there. All right, so next up we have uh, Jamie Heron, who is also from the SUNY Center for Professional Development. Jamie. Hi, thanks, Aaron, for having having me on. I'm sure. going to keep this short because I know it's 12:50 right now. I just wanted to highlight that we ran the remote teaching clinic uh, between March 18th and April 2nd. It seems like so long ago, but it really wasn't that long ago. We have all of the recordings available for people to review on the SUNY CPD YouTube channel. Um, if you go to the COVID site, the link's also there. So if you don't have access to this uh, this presentation later, you can always just go to the COVID site. We also have some more programming. The SUNY Accessibility Week is running right now. It runs the 18th through the 22nd. We focus on a couple of different areas. Today is the introduction to accessibility, and then tomorrow we'll focus on course design and LMS specific content. Wednesday, we'll highlight the authoring tools, including Microsoft Word, and PowerPoint and PDF. We have two versions of the, the Word and PowerPoint. We have the desktop client uh, version, accessibility concerns, and then the Office 365. So depending on which version of Word or PowerPoint you use, you, you can get instruction on how to make those uh, tools accessible. Thursday, we focus on audiovisual, audio video tools. So, uh, captioning and other tips and tricks in order to make your audio or your video content in your courses accessible to your students. We have two sessions that focus on STEM and online labs and accessibility for both of those topics. And then we're ending the day with uh, planning for accessibility on Friday and, and a closing workshop as well. If you're not able to attend those, uh, we do encourage you to come back and, and review the, the materials on our playlist. Those will be up you know, about 36 to 48 hours after the presentation occurs. But the registration link is here on the, on the presentation as well. I encourage you to go register for those if you can't. Even if you can't attend one of the meetings, if you register, then you'll get a link to the recording. It's kind of convenient. Um, and finally, uh, the new announcement we have here, we're launching a remote teaching institute for teaching and learning in the age of COVID-19. This is broken up into three separate uh, synchronous uh, dates. The 22nd through the 26th will be a practical course design webinar. And Erin, can you show the save the date? Awesome. So you can see here that it's designed uh, for faculty in the preparation for the fall 2020 semester. We know that uh, we're planning for a whole bunch of different contingencies, right, this, this fall. So the, the institute here will help develop materials for your courses that may or may not be face-to-face -face and what to do when you have to seamlessly move from one of those modalities to the other, et cetera. So we'll focus on some alternative content delivery strategies, some really good course design practices, really practical ones, right? So they'll come away with, with a product at the end of the webinar, right? Building that flexible syllabus, similar to what Teresa was just talking about, some alternative assessment strategies, 
uh, instead of just the multiple choice questions that people are so concerned about academic integrity with what are some different ways we can assess student learning and then dive deeper into the academic integrity uh, concepts itself using the Oscar rubric right to to as a recipe to simplify that course development and then of course ensuring equitable access because we can't have these conversations without talking about accessibility We'll then be offering these asynchronous materials for resource sharing and collaboration as well as mentoring. We have some people who have volunteered their expertise to go in and, and work with faculty throughout the summer as they are using the skills they acquired in the practical course design webinar series. They can then look at all these materials, they can collaborate, they can ask for help, etc. with a synchronous progress check at July 15th and then a follow-up webinar series in August that focuses on flexible instruction, right? So you've built this course, now how do you engage your students? How do you work with, um, how do you grade some of these things, et cetera? Um, the registration announcement will be coming in early June, but we wanted to get the save the date before campuses kind of dispersed for the, for the summer. And yes, the webinars are free. We're really focused because we know that campuses are all in a budget crunch right now. So we're really focused on some free programming. And I can actually upload, I think, oh no, sorry, apparently I can't put the file up in this, um, but I'll be posting the save the date on Workplace. If you wanna follow me or Chris or the CPD on Workplace, you can get these up-to-date announcements. I do have that save the date PDF though. I can get that posted for everybody. Great, I just grabbed it too. So oh, thanks. I'll put this in the chat here, so there we go. Okay. All right, thank you, Jamie. There. A lot of great stuff coming up. Um, <clears throat> and I would encourage you to, to check out the remote teaching clinic. The past recordings, those are on our um, our COVID site, as Jamie mentioned, under webinars and training, we have a uh, recording section here. So you can see past webinars based on those things. So what I'll do is um, for the remainder, remaining four minutes, <laughs> not very much time, um, but I know there's been some really active discussion. I'll allow um, participants to unmute yourself or you can continue to type in the chat if you have any questions for any of our speakers today. I wanna make sure that you have time to ask those. And um, I know people are probably asking about the recording of this, um, so I'll put that in here for you. It is going to be on our YouTube channel, and um, it, that should be up uh, by the end of the day tomorrow because we just caption it first, uh, but we'll be sure to do that. And then um, the slides will also be linked in the description on that video so that you'll be able to get all of the presenter slides and all of the links that they shared. So it'll all be together in one place for you. We also will add that link to the workplace event where some of you signed up or, um, or indicated that you were interested in this event. So it'll be posted in workplace as well as our YouTube channel. Are there um, any? Do you, do you yeah. save the chat as well there or should folks save the chat if they wanna save it themselves? Yeah, I mean, I do. Uh, so that can also be a file that we add if people wanted that. So that's a, that's a good idea, Chris, thanks. How do you access the YouTube channel, please? Sure, it's that last bit.ly that was just put in the chat. I'll post it one more time though for you. So it's current, it's uh, bit.ly and it's SUNY online videos. So that just takes you to our YouTube page where we have all of our videos posted and we'll be sure to have this one up there. Thanks. Absolutely. Well, I want to be sure to thank all of our um, speakers on this panel again. I really appreciate uh, your time today and your attention. Um, I should share with, uh, with folks the um, upcoming, there we go, uh, the upcoming session in June will focus on remote learning um, and that will be centered around the student supports that have been put in place on various campuses. And so that event will be in workplace. It will be the um, same URL that you used today.
All right, great. It looks like um, some good chat was happening. Thanks so much for all of your time and your attention, and I wish you all well and hope to see you at another one of our virtual events. Take good care. Thank you.